Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. Today's guest is, well, it's the second time back on the podcast. There will be a third, as you will find out by the end of this episode, because we ran out of time. And even then we went way over time. This is a long podcast and it's pretty technical, although I did my best to break it down for you guys as often as possible. So hopefully some of the big words become less scary as you're moving through. But my guest is Joel Green. Joel is the founder of Veep Nutrition, and he is the author of the Immunity Code book. He has also been my teacher for the last four months in the Immune Centric Coaches Immune Centric Coaches Training Program. And he runs an online program called the Immune Centric Fat Loss Program. And the guy's brilliant. If you haven't listened to the first podcast, it's, I believe it's back in 2021. I will include the link in the show notes. You'll want to go back and listen to that. And in this one, we really talk about all of the concepts he talks about in an immune centric lifestyle. So um, Joel's a great wealth of knowledge. He, his knowledge is so deep. My God, that course made my brain hurt, but I learned so much. So enjoy the episode. He sheds the light on a lot of myth busting, a lot of confusion out there, how things are not necessarily good or bad. It's really about the what, the when, and the how. And this is a constant um, mantra in everything that he does, in his books, in his programs, And when he's teaching other coaches, it's the same over and over again, the what, the when, and the how, not good or bad. So I'm going to let you go to the episode, but if you're looking to connect with Joel, he's the real, uh, real Joel green on Instagram. It's veepnutrition.com online. And, um, if you're looking to connect with me, you've got my coordinates. It's natnidham.com. It's the Facebook group on Instagram. It's Natalie Nidham. And, um, if you love this podcast, if you enjoy this episode, please make sure that you share it with your friends, your family, your network, anybody who you feel would get value from it. And if you're feeling inspired, please do leave us a review because those reviews is what allows us to grow, to get great guests for you and to reach more people. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you guys. Enjoy the episode. Hey folks, just a little bit of housekeeping before we launch into the episode. Please uh, remember that all of the information provided in these podcasts is for information purposes only. We are never offering treatments, cures, whatever, for any kind of disease or medical condition. Anything you hear about here is going to be intriguing. There's some research around it, but make sure that you check with your medical provider before you go off and um, do any of this stuff for yourself. All right. So, um, Enjoy the episode. And also, if you're looking to connect with me for any reason, um, with your comments, questions, whatever it may be, you can reach me through my website, which is natnidham.com, or you can find me on Facebook in the Biohack, in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance group, or on MeWe in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance group. And of course, you can also follow me on Instagram, which is at Natalie Nidham. Natalie is with an H between the T and the A, the second A. So thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you guys. Enjoy the episode. Well, guys, welcome back to the show. My guest today. Okay, well, I'm just so excited because first of all, it's the second time I'm recording with Joel Green. And so first of all, welcome to the podcast, Joel. Thanks, Nat. Great. Really great to be on it now, given, you know, like we know each other and friends and all that. So yeah. Lots all that kind of stuff. Great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I, I interviewed Joel, I guess last year sometime um, about the immune centric code book, which was a great interview. We had a great conversation. And even at that time I had the book and I was like, God, I love what this guy's saying, because I've always been this person running around saying, you know, even when I was into the keto diet, I was like, this can't be good for everybody. And I knew it wasn't good for me. And, and then I was doing this Mediterranean keto version or whatever. And then I've always been a person that has like into to my core believed in personalization of everything for people, including diet. Like I could never get my head around everybody needs to X or Y or Z. And we're going to talk a bit, a little bit about some of those things today. And when I read your book, I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is like manna from heaven. This is unbelievable because 
here's a guy who's actually gotten his head around the fact that there, A, there is no one diet, but B, we need to be able to eat different things and then understanding what to eat and when, which really kind of, I think a couple of the concepts you talk about in this book that everybody hears all the time. Is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Should, you know, is this food good? Is this, not even for me, is this a good food or a bad food? And you sit there and you like napalm that. It's like, boom, forget it. There's no good and bad. I mean, obviously crispy, deep, deep fried crispy cream donuts coated in bacon and pop, topped up with cream cheese, possibly not the best decision you could make. <laughs> But you move into this, instead of good and bad, you move into this place of the what, the when, and the how, which is freaking brilliant. Not swearing. I said freaking, not the other word. So I'm going to let you rip. And I'm going to just start you off with what do biohackers need to know and understand about the immune-centric approach to diet? Because that's really, like, that is right now, that is the core of your world. And it's, and it's amazing because it touches on fat loss. Yes, but it touches on it within the context of longevity, within the context of healing your body, within the context of the microbiome. So hitting these major, major spheres that everybody else thinks they need to just focus on the one thing. And you kind of bring it down to this immune centric diet. Ready? Go. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, so um, what what I would offer is that uh, the idea of a, an immune centric approach to health is really at the highest level about taking hold of the rudder. It's it's really about this notion that there are apex mechanisms. Um, you know, we use that word apex when we're thinking of predators, like the apex predators, the shark or the killer whale. You know. But the, the apex mechanisms of the body are all immune mechanisms. And, you know, it's really true when we look at just about anything that we would want to concern ourselves with. So whether that would be the gut or body fat or muscle or the circulation, the endothelium, when you look at what is the most true thing you could say in terms of the governing mechanisms of any of those things, they turn out to be immune mechanisms. For example, Let's take uh, workout recovery and muscle synthesis. So what we see with uh, workout recovery and muscle synthesis is that at the highest level, the governing mechanisms are macrophages and macrophage polarity, meaning macrophages flipping from the inflammatory state where they drive inflammation to the uh, inflammation resolving state uh, where they resolve inflammation. And that that flip in macrophage polarity is what is the uh, domino, the first domino that governs muscle synthesis and myofiber um, generation, regeneration. And so, so this yeah, just I'm going to interrupt you one second just for explaining to people that what a macrophage is. Macrophage is, is an immune, it's, it's an immune molecule. So maybe you can explain to people very quickly that a macro what a macrophage is within the immune system. Like this is not a muscle cell. Right, right. And macrophage is an immune cell. So uh, macrophages are, um, think of them kind of like the, uh, the frontline defenders, the first line defenders of immunity. They are part of, in, part of the innate immune system and they begin really in the bone marrow and the blood. And, uh, and they have different names when they're in the blood they call them monocytes, but then they, they move into tissues and whenever, whenever we're talking biology, we got to use a big word where a simple word would do. So, so we, <laughs> exactly. use the word, we use the word translocate for oh. move. okay. moves from and one place to another in plain English. <laughs> what does that yeah, mean? That's really serious. Translocation. <laughs> so they, uh, they move in, yeah. in, uh, from, the, from the blood into, into different tissues. So when they move into tissues, then, then we call them macrophages. And, okay. and again, a little big wordology, that's macrophage. Macro means big and phage means eat. So it means big eater. That's what that means. So these big eaters, they just move. And what's interesting about them is that they very much um, act sort of as the, um, you could call it the traffic cop, or you could call it the judge, or, you know, they kind of act at this executive level to sort of recruit and attract um, 
other signals and other mechanisms related to um, the immune system. So related to gathering the onset of inflammation or resolving inflammation. And there's these simplistic kind of nomenclatures that exist to describe them um, sort of, you know, as I use even dumber ones in my book. I use the red team, blue team, blue team, yep. cool things down, red team. But um, the reality is much more complex. They, they, they have very, a very complex sort of um, uh, milieu of what's called them different modes, different ways they can function. But the simple way to understand them is that basically they either resolve inflammation or send the signals out to do that or to, to bring inflammation on. And, and that has a whole lot to do with everything. So what we see is that in, in uh, for example, a lot of, a lot of uh, disorders, a lot of the different issues, um, let's take the case of obesity, for example. What you see is too many of the wrong kind, um, right. too many macrophages and the wrong kind. So we see like the inflammatory kind, we see way too many. And what happens is they act as sort of the, um, the mediators. So they, they put out these signals um, in the inflammatory state. They're, they're really triggering uh, very key inflammatory mediators. So, that, so interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, um, nuclear factor kappa beta, all of these sort of inflammatory mediators. Um, these macrophages are putting them out and they attract more inflammation. So what we see in obesity is we really see inflamed fat. You really see, um, you see, so you see that um, the, the sort of inflammatory milieu of the, of the adipose mass is in this state where it's essentially inflamed and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do properly. It doesn't store lipids properly. It doesn't work with insulin, all these things. Yeah. And so taking an immune centric approach, really what we're doing is we're just starting at the top. That's the easiest way to think about it. We're just starting with the rudder of the ship. And so it's, it's a different way to think about mm -hmm. things. You know, like I, I started to talk about muscle, for example. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to get you back to that. Like how, oh, what is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in an immune centric approach, what we would do is we would begin to think about the minute one from the end of your workout all the way through the complete resolution of the tissue damage. And that's, that's what a workout is. You're creating these little micro injuries and the immune system kicks in to repair them. So where this leads us to is looking at how things really work. That, that's really where it leads us to. So in that first hour, what we see is uh, T cells and immune signals that are inflammatory. So we see interleukin 1B, we see helper T cells, we see macrophages that begin to initiate these inflammatory signals, interleukin 6. And that's absolutely essential, essential to drive muscle recovery. So we have to get inflamed. Mm -hmm. In fact, with um, as you know from our, our coaches course, Nat, I was yep. fortunate to have you in that, which was a huge monster blessing to have you there. You're such a resource. Oh, well, um, it was amazing to be there. Believe me, my head is still trying to shrink back to its normal size. Well, I think, I think likewise, I think everybody there. Uh, so <laughs> for the audience, uh, we, we had Nat come in and do a peptide session and everybody was just absolutely blown into the, into the rafters by that. And it was, it was fantastic. It's the most, it's the most asked for set uh, recording. In the whole thing, everybody's like, "Hey, is the peptide session up yet? Put it up. <laughs> I gotta put it up. I paid you. I paid you money." <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, back to this. So, yeah. So, um, inflammation, <laughs> muscle building. Yeah. Yes, I know. You and I digress quickly, but um, so yeah. So, in in an immune centric approach to this whole thing, we just begin to to really map out what's happening post mm -hmm. post exercise, and so what we see is a big picture, uh, a, a short period of increased inflammation mediated by macrophage polarity, mediated by inflammatory macrophages. And then we see a flip and that flip is a hundred percent everything with muscle synthesis. If that flip doesn't happen, there's no muscle synthesis. And that flip is driven by macrophages. So it's driven by immune mechanisms. And it's driven by the flip um, in polarity from the inflammatory type to the anti-inflammatory type. And what you see with different populations that have trouble gaining muscle yeah. is the problem comes with the flip. It doesn't happen or it happens way too late or it happens at the wrong time. And if that flip doesn't happen roughly, roughly about a day post-workout, two days post-workout where macrophages flip polarity, they go to the M2 type and that begins to initiate all of the repair work and muscle synthesis, then muscles don't grow period. So in a immune centric approach, again, it's just really 
And it's really coming at the highest level of how things actually work. And then from a biohacker's point of view, it's looking at, well, can we hack this? And, mm -hmm. and the answer is not only yeah, but it's like much easier than we think because we're really just going after the rudder. You know, we're not trying to steer the ship with tugboats pushing on it. We're not trying to, we're trying to just get our hands on the rudder and turn it. That's what we're trying to do. And so we begin to look at, well, initially, how can we drive greater inflammation in that first hour? How can we drive um, interleukin one, interleukin six in that first hour? And then really, as we get into day one, day two plus workout, how can we strengthen signal strength for the M2 or the inflammation resolving macrophages? How can we drive more of that to drive more resolving signal strength mm -hmm. to get more muscle synthesis? And, and it's not as hard as you might think. So it's more about understanding when to do what. Well, I was going to say it's the, it comes down to timing again. It's that big thing of don't yeah. be pounding the antioxidants during and right after your workout, right. hold on, let it go for a bit and then bring in the troops. Yeah. It's, it's really much more about a finesse sort of way of approach. Just understanding when do we need to um, flip the, uh, flip the on, so to speak. Yeah. So what are some of the things that people can do? So, I mean, we have a lot to cover today, but just very quickly, let's say we've, we've introduced this concept of managing the inflammatory status of the muscle pro and, and against. So what are a couple of simple things that people can do to help support that inflammation and then turn it off when it's time? Yeah. So what, when, and how, um, what, when, so, how? Yeah. <laughs> no good, no bad. <laughs> Yeah, so so the what the the what piece of it um, isn't really that spectacular, you know. It's more about the when and the how. Yeah. So so the first thing, a couple simple things you could do, is immediately post workout, like once you're done, three simple things. You you would want to take citrulline at that point. Now most pre workouts put citrulline in it before. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but ideally, what you'd want is the citrulline really kind of right at the end of your workout, because what's going to happen is at the end of the workout, the citrulline is going to get in there in your system and it's going to spin up nitric oxide and nitric oxide is going to spin up all these inflammatory mediators right at the end of your workout where you need it. So this is going to drive the inflammation onset. It's just going to kick it. It's like, it's like kicking a football right when you need to kick the field goal. Yeah. The other thing with that would be just go get hot. So if you, if you combine getting hot at the exact same time that you're doing citrulline, and then another thing you'd want to throw with that would be a little bit of um, glutamine. And so glutamine, citrulline, and getting hot right at the end of the workout. And again, the what's aren't that big a deal. There's nothing esoteric about any of those things. It's like, okay, we know about those things. It's, so really all of the new cool stuff is in the when and the how, not so much the what. So, so right at the end of the workout, that's where you want that. And what you're gonna get from that is you're gonna get more signal strength on the inflammatory recruitment. Okay. okay, which we think of as bad normally. Oh, inflammation is bad. I don't want that, right? No, you do, right? At the end of the workout, you want as much as you can get. Okay. In fact, in older populations, that's exactly the problem. Uh, as you begin to get older, what happens is you don't get as inflamed as you should right after your workout, but four days later, you're way more inflamed than you should be. So, yeah. So it never goes down. You have this constant right. fire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you can't gain muscle because the flip never happens. Okay. Then and then as we're getting into the, uh, the second day, so we're really past the 24 hour mark. Now we need to begin to focus on flipping macrophages into the anti-inflammatory state. So um, a simple way to do that is um, D-mannose. Okay, so D-mannose is a sugar. Yeah. <laughs> and um, D-mannose has the effect of flipping macrophages uh, to the M2. And, and because it's a sugar, you know, it's ubiquitous in the system, it gets everywhere. And so just again, it's not so much, and, and I could go on. I can just keep piling things on. Here, oh yeah, but, no, yeah. <laughs> but the point is, I remember that lecture. <laughs> it just kept going. <laughs> so the point with all of this here is just um, the 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 new cool, the new sexy is the when and the how, uh, as much as what. That's the that's the point. So in, in the incentric approach, um, nutshell is highest level of how things work, and really getting our arms around how they work and what, when, and how to use things. Absolutely. And it's, it's a steering approach. It's a, I love your rudder analogy because it is literally your, through your diet, through your supplementation, through your practices, you are steering the ship as opposed to just being like this passive passenger on the ship, whether it's the foods that you eat and when you eat them and how you eat them or the supplements that you take, 
it's all in the what, the when, and the how. And it literally that you could have named the book what, when, how. It would have made, you know, it would have been perfect also. It it just wouldn't have said anything to anybody. Immune centric is way better. But but that what, when, how is so central to everything in that immune centric approach. So, you know, so let's let's maybe drill into a couple of the like more granular pieces of the immune centric approach and things like, and you know, this is going to play into a couple of the later questions. Like I'm going to ask you at some point, you know, what your thoughts are on the carnivore diet and the keto diet. And, but before we go there, what about fiber? You know, fiber, people are either, you know, kind of worshiping at the altar of fiber or (laughs) they are, they're kind of like going, oh, fiber. No, I can't handle that. Like, that's just the worst thing for me. Or you, you actually have another camp of people that go, oh, you don't need that shit. You're good. You're fine. You don't need it. And right. so I happen to know because <laughs> of the last few months I've spent with you that fiber is your friend and fiber is a beautiful thing and understanding different types of fiber and when to kind of leverage them again is critical. So tell us about fiber in the immune centric world. <laughs> Yeah, sure. That's a good one. Um, so so fiber is fibers had a rough year or two <laughs> or, or three. It's, it's, uh, it's taken a few shots. Um, yeah. and you know, we'll get into this later, I guess, but, um, the first thing I would say is that fiber is absolutely essential to have in the diet. That being said that fiber, the ability to handle fiber is very much a muscle and that it very much works like any muscle. So the common mistake we see with fiber is that what you see a lot of nowadays is that a given person will have done, you know, a diet for two, three years. I mean, they did the keto diet or they've done a combination of keto, fasting, carnivore, you know, they did that for three, four years. And then they hear, you know, they change their mind. They hear fiber is good. And they hear, they hear me talk and they hear someone talk about it. And then they think, well, maybe I'll give it a shot. And then what happens is it's, it's a muscle. It, so it's, they, what they, what they do is they, you know, they go have a bunch of blueberries or a bunch of resistant starch all at once, and then they don't feel good or they get bloated. Mm-hmm. The reason is not because you can't handle fiber. The reason is that it, from disuse, that muscle, the ability to digest fiber has essentially waned. And like any muscle, you're going to have to build it back up. Now I'm using the word muscle. Well, there's muscles have nothing really to do with fiber. I'm just making an analogy. Don't even misquote me. But basically, all that to say that um, you must have fiber in the diet um, because when you reverse engineer, and this is probably something we'll get into. Yeah. When you reverse engineer what, when you reverse engineer the healthiest bacteria that we know of, and by and large, when we look at people who don't have them, what we see, and we see nothing but medical conditions, when you reverse engineer what feeds those bacteria, it's fibers, okay, and nothing else. So for that reason alone, you could say fiber is essential, but it's also essential because when you reverse engineer the pathways, which we did in our course, when you reverse engineer the pathways by which the short chain fatty acids are made and synthesized, it's readily apparent and you can just see it right in front of you that the very best way to, to get what you need, to get what the body needs, which is a proper ratio of short chain fatty acids in the right amounts, um, in the right ratios, along with antioxidants, the very best way to get that is through fiber. Now you can get that through um, other means. You can get it through proteins, but it's not optimal. Um, mm-hmm. And it would take a long time to break that down here. I won't do it, but suffice to say that um, fiber has gotten a bad rap. Um, we need fiber in the diet. Um, but <clears throat> to introduce fiber in the diet, if you haven't been having it, it's going to take a long time and you have to have a very slow approach to it because you know, it, it's just like saying you want to take up marathon running, you know, okay, great. That's fine. Start by walking around the block. That's yeah. 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 No. And you know what? I'll, I'll weigh in with my personal experience here. And I mean, I think, you know, this whole idea of if you don't eat fiber, what you're really doing is starving out the bacteria in your gut who break down the fiber, who make the short chain fatty acids, who are going to, and like the butyrate, like the whole nine yards. And then people are sitting there trying to supplement them from the top down. God knows what happens to them by the time they get to where they need to be, they're lost or whatever the case may be. But I was a person who I'd gotten to the point where me and chickpeas were like, it was just a disaster. (laughs) 
<laughs> it was, this was not going to be a thing for me. And I'll stick to chickpeas because as you know, whey protein is another food that I was never able to consume. And that ever since I did the microbiome reboot that you do, like the, and that common cell push in the whole nine yards, and which is without going into detail, what it is ultimately doing is re inoculating, recultivating that. And it's not diversity for the sake of diversity, but it's feeding those bugs in your gut that you specifically need to do specific jobs in the body. All of a sudden, I can eat chickpeas. What if I want? I can throw them. As a matter of fact, I do that every other day. <laughs> I throw some chickpeas in with my cooked and cooled rice. I mean, I you learn that it's, and you know, it's funny, like I've almost done a post once in a while saying, it's just not about you. It's about your bugs. Like it's, this is everything you do is not always about you because those bugs do for you what humanity has yet to figure out how to do for itself. Like I always, the way I look at it, it's even the way I look at peptides a little bit, especially the bioregulators, they're not doing for the body. All they're doing is they're, they're flipping switches that enacts those cascades in the body that, that the human body has built in, in ways that we have yet to understand. And so I just, that's the, that's the, like, how far upstream can you get? And then just sit back and watch what happens. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I haven't thought of that, which is they, they do for you what humanity has not figured out how to do for us. I'm going to use, I'm going to steal that. Consider that stolen. Consider it friend. offered. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say, well, I'll, I'll, I'm stealing it. a great analogy I got from Natalie Mitta, which is they have. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I get notoriety, notoriety out of it. Yay me. <laughs> All right. Here's another one that has gotten a beating. And I don't think it's just over the last two to three years. I think it's over the last several years. And that's insulin because it's seemed poor insulin. You know, it's like everybody wants to beat on insulin. Insulin is bad. I get people in my group or clients who are like, oh my God, I got this crazy insulin spike. And I'm like, okay, but how long did it last? Like, what did you eat? What, what caused it? And how long? Because I mean, you know, if you eat a bolus of glucose and your insulin goes sky high, guess what? It's kind of supposed to. <laughs> the point is, does it take you half an hour for that insulin to come, for that spike to come down? Or is it going to keep going forever? In which case you've alienated your insulin and you're screwed. So let's, let's kind of give some love to our friend insulin, shall we? <laughs> yeah, boy, that, that is, uh, <clears throat> that, man, I think we could, we could probably do a, a three-parter on that one. That's, that's, yeah. Such a critical, important piece of health. Um, so you're right. Uh, insulin has, is another one that's taken a beating the last few years. And, you know, the, the important thing, there's a few things at the high level I'll start with that I think are really important to understand. One is that a lot of what happens is because of CGMs. Oh, right now. Nah, let's pause this for one second. Yep, I got you. This, this is, uh, it, this will take me. Okay, yeah, uh, boy, that, that is a fantastically critical question. Uh, and, and insulin's really, really taken a beating the last few years. Um, so the really important thing to understand about insulin is first of all, you must make insulin. It, it, insulin is the primary hormone that is responsible for clearing glucose from your blood and moving it into, into your cells, okay? And so when insulin doesn't work right, uh, nothing else in the body is going to work right. Um, insulin is, it, it, to call it a master hormone, we have to understand that uh, it, it is intimately entwined with the aging process, okay? That, and, and really the, the takeaway from this is that you need to have insulin work as efficiently as possible. You need to make it, but you need to make it efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you, in order to do that, you need two things. You need to stimulate it on a regular basis. You need to treat it like it's a muscle. And if you don't use that muscle, it's gonna go into disrepair. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you have to stimulate it both directly and indirectly, okay? And this gets into really understanding that there are, the insulin does not work by itself. There are a family of hormones that make insulin do its thing. Uh, several hormones. There are um, adiponectin, there are what are called the incretin hormones. That's a GIP, glucose, insulotropic polypeptide, and GLP-1, glucogen-like peptide. 
So these are stomach hormones. And all of these hormones together work as a family and a team. So insulin doesn't do its thing by itself. So you need to stimulate insulin. You need foods that stimulate insulin. So those are gonna be fibers, fruits, carbohydrates, because if you don't do that, what you're gonna see is that you become insulin resistant, meaning that it's, yeah. it's just like asking your, it's just like asking yourself, to, it's just like the cardiovascular system. Like yeah. you don't use your cardiovascular system on a regular basis and you go for a jog, good, good luck. luck. <laughs> you're gonna be white. But if on a regular basis, you train the cardiovascular system, it's gonna be very, very, very efficient. It's gonna work very well for you. So insulin works very much the same, like when it is stimulated on a regular basis with um, healthy foods that mm -hmm. sharpen it directly and indirectly. So that's the key is that we can target insulin directly with certain foods, but we can also target it indirectly with certain foods. We can target it by targeting GLP-1, GIP. Uh, and so really what this gets down to is that insulin has gotten a very bad rap. What you see is very common nowadays is to avoid anything that stimulates um, insulin. And that's the, that's the thing we've, we've gone to. So we'll just avoid anything that makes us make insulin. And I just tell you what I see on a routine basis daily. I see people coming off that trip. It's like, a, it's like a boat cruise you went on where they said, you're going to have the time of your life. <laughs> you go on a cruise and you come back and you're fat and, you know, and, and, and nothing works right. And it's because you, you know, you did your carb free diet for three years and then you come off that and your gut's jacked up and insulin is highly resistant. You, you don't make it when you need it. And so it's, again, it's like a muscle that you didn't train for three years. And so for that reason, um, what the, the takeaway that, you know, if you're a biohacker, what you really have to understand about insulin is that it, it, it is not only intimately tied to metabolic health, it directly controls the rate of aging through a couple of specific pathways. One is the MAPK pathway. And the best way to think of that pathway is that each cell can split kind of 50, 60 times can divide. And that within cells, there's a, there's a clocking system that kind of makes decisions about when we should, you know, go ahead and move forward and, you know, divide and move to the next cell and move into a different phase. And that's directly controlled by insulin. Hmm. The other pathway that is critical is uh, protein synthesis. And that is directly governed by insulin because insulin governs a key thing called mTOR and which governs protein synthesis. So we need to work out the muscles that control insulin sensitivity, just like the cardiovascular system, you need to keep the cardiovascular system sharp by, by using it. Um, and a, a big problem that really we find these days is through CGMs. What you see is this sort of, um, I would call it CGM myopia. And it's- So, so CGMs, for those of you who don't know, are continuous glucose monitors. So those are the, those are the, if you see someone walking around looking like they have a little button on the back of their arm, and you're wondering what the heck is this going on? That is an implant with a tiny little thread needle that is sampling the blood sugar in their interstitial tissue, like it is space. It's not even in a blood vessel. So that's what CGMs are. And what Joel's talking about is that now in the biohacking space, a lot of people have taken to wearing these CGMs. You wear it for two weeks at a time and it reports back what your blood sugar levels are continuously through the day. So I apologize for interrupting you, but I just wanted to make sure we still had everybody with us on the CGM boat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really, really good. Thank you. Uh, the, the critical, so what we see a lot of nowadays is a, is a kind of myopia, which is, you know, like, uh, I'm wearing a CGM and it said that I, uh, I ate fruit and I had that insulin. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And um, the thing to understand is that number one, they do not measure insulin. They measure glucose. Those are two completely different things. Okay. Your serum glucose has nothing that, you know, serum glucose um, does not directly tell you what your insulin output is. It doesn't tell you your insulin efficiency. So you can have a um, high reading on your, uh, on your glucose monitor. And if you're insulin efficient, then you'll clear that pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's sort of a way to understand that. So it's very easy to get sucked into looking at numbers and then think every food is bad that that causes you know the needle to move at all you have to avoid that because um that is a problem of the infancy of the market it's these things are new and they are helpful but they are not the gospel and don't treat them like the gospel because 
they are not directly measuring insulin. They're measuring um, glucose. And often they're not accurate. You know, you I was going to say that. I've seen them be very inaccurate. Like I've seen continuous glucose monitors not line up with the, you know, the more basic finger prick test that people would do historically, which is that, that blood test. You just prick your finger, you put a drop of blood on the little, little thingy. Like <laughs> what's the thingy called? I don't know. It's, it's like, um, I don't know. yeah. It, and then yeah. You, it fits into a glucose monitoring device that those numbers don't always line up with the CGM. And sometimes the CGM is completely out of whack. I have one client yeah. who almost drove herself to, like to distraction because her CGM was completely wrong all the time. For whatever yeah. reason, those things don't work for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, in, in a sense, CGMs are a fad in a sense. Um, and they're going to they're gonna improve dramatically over the next 10 years. Yeah. So, so don't, don't take them too serious is what I would say. But more importantly, um, you, you really have to shift your mindset to understand that um, much like the, much like you can have cardiovascular efficiency, you know, you, you can, you can be completely out of shape here because you never train it. Yeah. You can, you can be completely out of shape with respect to the production of insulin because you never train it. In other words, you never feed it directly and indirectly. And that's, that's, that's a shift in thinking that is um, it's an, uh, I'll use the word apex again. It's an apex level shift in thinking because you're, we're coming at this from the highest level of what's true that you need insulin to work efficiently and you need it not just for metabolic health, but you need it to age well. Perfect. No, I love that. And, um, and I, you know, this is going to just remember these guys, this is, we're foreshadowing to our keto and carnivore diet in a little while here, but before we do that, there's two more things I want to touch on quickly. Uh, one was GLP one because GLP one's become, it's be, it's slowly starting to bubble up into the mainstream because of a new drug that is uh, that is a peptide, really, that has been manipulated by a drug company to have a much longer half life than the actual molecule, the actual compound that we secrete naturally in our gut. So let's talk about GLP-1 and how food stimulated, and we can just talk yeah. about GLP-1. I don't know how far you want to go down the GLP-1 agonist hole. You don't have to go there at all if you don't want to, but let's talk about because people need to understand GLP-1 even in the context of a GLP-1 agonist so that they understand what is it that I'm affecting? What am I trying to impact here and what might be the other impacts along the way? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. This is something that is going to explode in the next couple of years because um, we're, we're really getting to how things work here with this. So. Um, so I said that insulin doesn't work alone. It has these helper hormones. And the easy way to understand this is at the highest level, just think about something. It's that the ingestion of food needs to coordinate a number of different mechanisms in different places in the body. So when, when food comes into the body, the, 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 the gut needs to kind of coordinate with the pancreas. So we kind of have, have to have a little back and forth here about how much insulin should you make. And then that needs to coordinate sort of with the neurons in the brain to say, I, I think we've had enough. We can stop now or no, nah, 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 we need to have a little bit more, you know, maybe throw some salt on it. <laughs> so, so there's, there's this, there are these feedback loops that are intercoordinated across the entire body, across multiple mechanisms in the body. And it encompasses, um, uh, uh, neurons in the brain, it encompasses, um, you know, different organs, it encompasses uh, uh, blood sugar, like sort of modulation and intracellular extra. So th there's all this coordination going on. There's all these feedback loops. And central to these feedback loops are these kind of um, what you would call sort of master hormones, and, you know, insulin obviously being one, but, but insulin works with gut hormones. So insulin is a pancreatic hormone, but then when food gets in the gut, there are hormones that directly kind of tell us, that kind of, kind of tell the pancreas to throttle up, throttle down. So two of the most important are what are called the incretin hormones. Yeah. And these are, these are GIP, glucose insulotropic polypeptide and GLP-1 glucogen like peptide one. These hormones are called insulotropic, um, which just means that they make insulin um, more efficient. They make insulin do its thing better. They kind of like help the pancreas 
decide like eh, just a little bit more. Okay, we're good. Okay. Yeah, they're calling so, on ins- they're calling out the insulin. They're like, come on, we need some help here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and so these these feedback loops um, are critical critical to metabolic health, critical to body fat, critical to everything. So what we see is um, glucogen, GLP-1, glucogen-like peptide, um, has a number of really remarkable effects. Um, it, seems to, it seems to really uh, make insulin much more efficient, makes insulin do its job much better. It, it, the way you can think of it is like, <clears throat> if you th- think of like a, like a, like a javelin, you, know, you, you can throw a javelin, but then there's a tool, I forget the name of it, but you can attach it to the end of a javelin and it kind of works like a fulcrum. That thing goes like twice as far. Huh. So it kind of works like that a little bit. Um, well, it's kind of like those tools you use to throw the ball for your dog when you're someone like yeah. me and you can't throw right. a ball yeah. work to, to save your yeah. life, right? So you yeah. use that thing and all of a sudden you're a star pitcher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, that's a good way to think of GLP. It's like that, like the dog, the dog throw tool. <laughs> but um but beyond that, what GLP-1 uh, notably, uh, indisputably does is that it helps uh, body fat, helps you reduce weight, reduces hunger, and um, very, very good for met- metabolism. And in, in conjunction with that, what you find is that a lot of the receptors for GLP work together with GIP, and GIP has uh, very favorable insulotropic effects as well. So the thing to understand is that this story begins with food. It's food that drives this. And so if we want to advance our understanding of how to control our bodies, then all we need to do in this instance is understand sort of the what, when, and how of how foods affect GLP-1 and GIP. And it turns out there's actually some fairly simple, easy things to do that help this whole thing along. So with with GLP-1, notably, there are a couple of things that kind of stand out. Uh, Two of those are eggs and fiber. So <clears throat> eggs and fiber, just kind of in general, uh, very specific types of fibers, resistant starches, um, things like that, really tend to stimulate GLP, make the, make, make, makes GLP-1 work very well. And then what we can do with that is we can kind of bring in timing into it. So there's some really good research that's demonstrated kind of like when you do these things it has a lot to do with, with incretin and GLP-1 secretion. So one of these things would be what's called a sweet preload. <clears throat> and a sweet preload really is kind of um, a little bit of something that's kind of sweet that you take about 30 minutes prior to a meal. And the, one of the reasons for doing that is that it directly stimulates GLP-1. So the stimulation of GLP-1 prior to a meal drives insulin efficiency up. And <clears throat> there's some good research uh, looking at this that really what happens, the net of it is you, you think that it's the opposite. You're taking in more calories, but actually what you're doing is you're making insulin more efficient mm-hmm. when you do it. And so as we begin to look at like, you know, GIP and GLP-1 um, through foods, we can begin to really stimulate these things. Um, one of the things that I introduced in the immunity code <clears throat> was the notion of one day of the week targeting targeting in a sort of on-off, on-off kind of pattern, Um, directly targeting insulin one day with foods that directly stimulate insulin. So these would be, you know, certain kinds of fibers, GLP-friendly fibers, uh, resistant starches, uh, fiber, uh, uh, phenol fruits. And then the next day targeting GLP-1 with um, foods that are fatty in nature. But what they do is those fatty foods stimulate GLP-1. So eggs, you know, avocado, things like that. And so by doing that, what we have is using food, we have kind of this indirect, direct, indirect, direct kind of way of addressing the whole family of insulin, addressing insulin, but then addressing the incretin hormones, particularly GLP-1, and using that to sensitize insulin so that long-term insulin is getting more efficient, more efficient, more efficient with time. And I, I think what's just incredibly promising now is that through the use of um, uh, peptides, kind of really in your neck of the woods, these two things can be married and I think the future is unlimited. I think it's going to solve a lot of problems. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I think, I mean, I, with the limited time I've, I've looked at GLP one agonists and these are, so two things, one is resistant starches. For those of you who are wondering what those are, you get resistant starch from uh, greenish bananas. You get resistant starch from cooked and cooled rice, cooked and cooled potatoes, raw asparagus. So these are foods that 
directly give you that resistant starch, but definitely on the GLP-1 agonist, and these are drugs, these are medications you can get by prescription from your doctor that target specifically, right now they're approved for type two diabetes and obesity. But if you look at all of the different effects and benefits of these, of these GLP-1 agonists for different systems in the body, like the brain, like the heart, the lungs even, I think, I think we're just going to see, hopefully, we're going to see their applications grow as people understand them more and the medical system is able to integrate them. I think there's even trials going on right now with Alzheimer's. Um, because again, as you said, if it's making your body more efficient with glucose, it, it actually, one of the mechanisms of action is improving the disposal of glucose into cells. And we know that with Alzheimer's, for some people, there's this insulin resistance happening in the brain cells. If we can address that, is it, you know, the, the hypothesis right now is what if we use GLP-1 agonist for these people, could it help to support their brain function and maybe even delay the death of those brain cells that leads to the, to the decline, the cognitive decline. Yeah, I think one other thing about this that gets so fascinating is that it's interesting how all this ties back to the gut. So <laughs> um, with GLP-1, another way that we can kind of have adequate stimulation of GLP-1 is it turns out that um, acromancia, Eusinilifa, the bacteria I talked about in, in the immunity code, yep. um, makes a protein that stimulates GLP-1. And so it Pill. turns out- <laughs> Pill protein. One the, <laughs> yeah. Um, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the mechanisms by which acromancia seems to correlate highly with the lean body is through GLP-1. It, it basically gets the body to make more GLP-1, gets you to be more efficient with it. And so it, it, it's really fascinating how all this works together. Yeah, no, that is, and it is fascinating. I think as you start to, people have like these different islands of knowledge and then you start to, to, to bring it together, right? Like the acromancia, the relationship between acromancia and GLP-1. Like we, we now know acromancia improve is associated with lean bodies. You want acromancia, you want to cultivate it. A lot of people are low in it, but people don't necessarily know they don't necessarily care as long as it's going to work for them. But at the same time, starting to connect those dots is for those of us who have a tendency to wear hats with propellers on them is super exciting. <laughs> and I try to tell my husband and he kind of looks at me. Yeah. Okay. What is it that I need to eat? <laughs> I'm like, you just have some apple peels. You'll be fine. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. The last hormone we're going to talk about today because I don't even know if we're going to get through everything, but the last hormone we're going to talk today is adiponectin. And people, I don't think this one's taken as much of a beating because most people can't say the word to begin with. They can't spell it. They don't even necessarily know it exists. There are people listening. I know you know all about adiponectin, but this is another one of these hormones that's intrinsically, I mean, there's so many, right? It's a symphony in the body. Everything is connected. And if you don't, if you haven't kind of figured that out, let us be the ones to tell you everything is interconnected, but adiponectin secreted by fancy word adipose tissue, plain English, fat cells um, is crucial in fat loss or weight management, that kind of thing. So let's, yeah, talk, uh, about, let's talk about adiponectin. <laughs> is it the, the forgotten, the hormone that doesn't get nearly enough attention, I think. <laughs> yeah. Let, let the riffing begin. I, I think uh, it's, it's almost like a it's almost like in the in the public awareness, there's it, it, it's like it's like a you know a product line that's in dev, and we're going to release GLP one this year and next year, and then after that, yeah, we're gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. um, yeah, so um, you know, if we're talking about insulin, mm -hmm. and we're, we're talking about uh, GLP one and these critical uh, gut hormones, um, there's another player that we really have to think about, and it it, it really is completely underserved. Um, in the thought sphere, but once you get what it does, it's elevated um, to like, wow, we really need to think about this one. And, and that is adiponectin. So adiponectin is what's called an adipokine. It's, um, it's a hormone that is secreted by your fat. <clears throat> and again, you know, I, when I started this whole diatribe off with on insulin was that there's a lot of coordination, a lot of feedback that has to go on between when food hits the gut and then the brain and then you know the digestive tract and then the pancreas well we can include uh, adipose tissue in that in that milieu of 
coordination because there's a whole bunch of um, sort of back and forth that has to happen when glucose hits the serum and insulin is produced with respect to fat cells. Yeah. So adiponectin um, is also an insulin sensitizing hormone. Yeah. And it's, it's very easy to think, well, my gosh, then it's good. But um, it, it's not, it, adiponectin, um, adiponectin can be really good. Um, it, it can be bad. Um, it, it just kind of depends. But <clears throat> the interesting kind of high level to understand about it is that it does two really critical things. The first is that adiponectin has a whole heck of a lot to do with making insulin work better. In fact, one of the, one of the hacks I introduced in the immunity code that's really taken off was glycine and jello. And that um, with glycine and jello, you know, taking those at night, you stimulate adiponectin while you're sleeping. And, you know, this all started back in 2010. And I, in my nutrition system, uh, we were doing a lot of corporate wellness. And I, I put that um, hack in there as part of the system. And people were saying, hey, I'm waking up leaner. I, I can see it. And it really was the glycine um, helping to stimulate adiponectin while they were sleeping. The other thing about adiponectin <clears throat> that is completely unknown and is it could in the future, it's going to dominate a lot of our talk the way that like acromancy it became popular here today, you know, yeah, it'll be that way. So, and the thing is, it has, has to do with muscle synthesis. So <clears throat> something completely unknown about adiponectin is that it's sort of a rate limiter or a rate, a rate regulating um, factor in the synthesis of muscle. And the way that it works is adiponectin secreted by adipokines, by, by fat cells. Um, sort of wanders around until it finds muscle. And then there is a special type of sort of docking molecule called a, a, a T cadherin that adiponectin sort of docks with when it finds muscle. And the reason that's important is it acts sort of as a bioregulator. What it does is it sort of regulates the, uh, the kind of the push pull between muscle synthesis and deposition of fat within muscle. So what we see with age is that the older we get, we have what's called um, essentially um, lipo, lipodystrophy or dysregulated lipid storage. Right. What we see is that fat cells are supposed to store fat. That's your job. You know, if you can't do your job, we'll go to you. Well, what we see with age is that fat cells don't get so good at that anymore. And so lipid droplets wind up in other places. And they, one of the places they wind up in is muscle. Well, that's disastrous when we start to see intramuscular lipid droplets. Um, an easy way to think of it is think of like, um, you know, like a really fatty steak. I was just thinking of a ribeye, like really well marbled. You just, yeah. you don't want to be the ribeye. <laughs> no, you don't want to be the ribeye. You want to be like the lean, gamey, grass-fed steak. Now, yeah. but, you know, in, in human terms, it's like, no, nah, dude, that I, don't want the, I don't want that corn fat. That's good. But from a metabolic perspective and from a, a longevity perspective, you really want to be the lean, the lean game animal, the one that's out running around in the wilderness. That's the one you want to be. Okay. Yeah. Um, what we see though is that um, adiponectin works um, to drive muscle synthesis. So when adiponectin is doing its thing and properly docking with the coherin on muscle, it drives muscle synthesis. And so what you see in older populations is this process starts to get dysregulated. And so we see more lipid storage in muscle and we see less muscle synthesis and it's directly controlled by adiponectin. So is that so, because adiponectin doesn't, doesn't dock to the receptor properly on the muscle? Yeah, yeah. You begin to get these issues of adiponectin sort of aggregation. Yeah. Um, and, and it affects muscle synthesis. So, huh. um, so that elevates adiponectin from like, kind of like, you know, kind of a, oh, that's interesting too, kind of discussion to like oh. several more steps up the food chain to understand that, you know, it's not just regulating insulin. It's also regulating muscle storage and muscle, or muscle synthesis. That, that makes it a, a very big deal. So um, all that to say all that we can put in one umbrella, which is insulin and all of the helper hormones with insulin. And suddenly insulin's back to the foreground. Whoa. Insulin's yeah. really important. And, and a good guy, you know, yeah. learning like, and, and something to be honored. We should be all bowing to the altar of insulin and proper function of insulin. So, so uh, yeah, I like how you kind of wrap that up. Like at the end of the day, what we've been talking about here, those the last little while is all about ways to stimulate insulin, to sensitize insulin, to get insulin working for us. So then let's maybe finish off with the carnivore diet and the keto diet. And 
Are you going to say that they're bad? Are you going to say that they're good? <laughs> no. Uh, tell I, tell I, us. I, tell us. Because <laughs> you kind um, of alluded to it a little bit in the post fat loss state where there could be a, a room for some of this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So um, there's a difference between a protocol and a way to eat for life. Okay. Um, you can do a protocol for a season. Um, historically speaking, the analogy of a protocol would be um, like that season where we killed a whale. Okay. Like, yeah. Like, and it's actually, I'm not making that up. Like, um, no, I know. <laughs> I, I've studied that. The, the, so they have a, the mission San Juan is down where I live and on the wall, they have the diet of, of the native Indians that lived here, you know, in Southern Cal. And it, it's shockingly varied. Like when you look at their diet, uh, that they, they weren't carnivores in, in that sense. They had a really varied diet based on availability and seasonal variability. But, but one of the things they would hunt is whales. And so like, if you got lucky and you got like maybe a calf, you know, I mean, then what you're looking at is a season, you know, however long that lasts and like, uh, it was, we're just steak tonight again. Um, and, and that's what you're eating. Um, so protocols, uh, refers to like the strategic or short-term use of a way to eat. And speaking to both of the keto diet and the carnivore diet as protocols, I think that they are wonderful protocols when used strategically. Uh, I think the keto diet can be life-saving when used, you know, in the right context, the right, the right patient, the right situation. I think it's, you know, wondrous. Uh, the carnivore diet, likewise, I think is highly utilitarian um, when used sort of in the right way as a protocol. I would not consider either one of those a way to eat for life because they, at their core, are about um, withdrawing from variety in the diet. They are about sort of a centralization of a few things. And the supporting idea for that is narrative. You know, mm -hmm. like it's based on, it's based on story. It's like we have a story that we spend a thousand billion years ago we don't know what happened no. like no one no one knows no one was there um, yeah. i've looked at the evidence for you know going back as far as we can go it actually supports the opposite it actually supports that you know and you can look at this is the widely anybody, anybody can go look this up you can go look at like dental you know um you can go look at uh, tooth impressions from people that lived 50,000 years ago they were eating varied diets. They, like there weren't refrigerators sitting by. So nobody was sitting there just eating tons and tons and tons of meat. Okay. But as a way to eat for life, I would just offer that the place you want to begin is to look at the bacteria that as far as we can tell right now, it seems to be that whenever these bacteria are present, you get long life, you get metabolic health, you get immunity, you get all that. And that's, you know, really the phytobacteria, acromancia, kind of the two prominent players in that. Not saying that they're the only ones, but I'm just saying that for simplicity's sake, we can see that when you have these species, uh, acromancia, the phytobacteria, and we look at what you get, you get lean people that live long. Mm -hmm. We can just reverse engineer this and go, well, how, how do you get these two? And the answer is fibers. That, that's the answer. The answer is fibers and fruits and resistant starch and phenols. You, you know, that's how you feed those bacteria. You don't feed them. You don't really feed them from fats. You don't really feed them from meats. So if you want to look at like, how do you get those in the diet, reverse engineering, what you need to eat to get those, um, it takes you into um, what I believe is the highest truth of dietary intake. And that is variety and balance in the diet over time is the healthiest thing you can do. And, and there's good reasons to believe that's true. One of those reasons has to do with when you take any food by itself, what you'll find is that it has benefits, but then it has uh, toxic aspects. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be, you know, it could be a plant food. It could be meat. It could be anything. It doesn't matter. The idea that, you know, these foods are bad, but these foods are good. These are the good foods. Eat these. That's not true. If you get too much of them, it doesn't matter what, you're, it doesn't matter what you, you could injure the gut with too much fiber. Okay. So fiber is essential, but too much. And you're going to injure the gut. The yes. same is true of meat. So um, we have seen diet fads, oh, you know, I've been around a long time. I can tell you, I've seen a lot of diet fads come and they come in five-year waves. So what I'm seeing right now is a lot of people that are on the keto diet. They've all gone to the carnivore diet. And that was, you know, three years keto. Now I'm on my three years of carnivore. They're not going to stick with it, um, for the most part. Um, and ultimately in terms of a health rationale, what we see is that different foods from different categories seem to neutralize the top toxic aspects of other foods in other categories. It, you can look at meat and fiber and see that immediately. So when you look at meat, 
and you put it in the gut, the first thing you see is that it ferments just like fibers. Both meat and fibers will ferment when they're put in the gut. The difference is that typically when fibers ferment in the gut, they make healthy metabolites. The exact opposite is true when you have meat fermenting in the gut. Now, I'm a big steak eater. I have a, you know, if you, if you went and opened my ice box right now, you'd see like, just like, you know, that dude eats a lot of meat. Whoa. <laughs> but what's true is that there's, there's variety in my diet. And, and so we can see this in the gut. When you see some of the toxic metabolites of, of meat fermentation, they're neutralized by adding fiber into the diet. So, so balance in the diet negates the toxic aspects of different foods done to extremes. Now that doesn't mean the four food groups. Like I'm not saying you have to eat four food groups at every meal. I, I believe you can have seasons. Like you could have a season you know, where you did something more carnivore or more keto or more vegan or whatever. But over time, we have to mimic what was always true, which was availability was driven by seasons and yeah. the variety in the diet out of the essential need to survive. Because if something wasn't available, you were going to eat whatever was available. And that's very much true, I think, of carnivore and keto as a way to eat for life. Um, you get into the detriments, which is um, the the strengths become negatives because you're not getting balance and variety in the diet. That's what I would say on that topic. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And I like the, the, the approach around seasonality because to your point from, you know, in the time before there was a grocery store and a fridge and whatnot, the, the modus operandi was eat to live. Like if it's there, mm -hmm. we're going to eat it. If we can catch it, we're going to eat it. And if we can't catch anything to eat, then we're going to eat what we can catch, which might be something that's buried under the ground, or it might be something growing on a tree and it can't run away. And, you know, the, I'd even, I've even heard this, this concept that, you know, in certain societies, by the time the end of summer and the end of fall rolled around, they were virtually pre-diabetic because they would have been gorging on the fruits and all the available stuff because, Again, we need to survive. We're going to fatten ourselves up, and not that they that not that they purposefully would fatten up, but the body is built that when there's food, we will store, so that when there isn't food, we will burn. And they would come into a winter time when there is no none of these fruits and vegetables and whatnot. They de facto kind of end up going keep carnivore, right, or keto carnivore, something like that. And now you start using up those fat stores and flipping your metabolism over getting going from the precipice of prediabetes back again getting lean again and starting all over again could this be kind of like um a more natural state of of the way things would have been than where we are today which is the you know the 24 7 perpetual buffet of life <laughs> where we eat everything all the time and in as much as we want. So I, I do, I love that you allow for, you know, the carnivore and the keto diet to have a place to have a function and yet maybe just not to be the one thing to do because we've, you know, again, anybody who's been in coaching for a while, we've seen people become insulin resistant from being on a keto diet from too long. And, um, and that is really upsetting to people, right? Because they've made all this progress they're feeling good. They finally figured it out. They've made it easy. And holy crap, what's happening now? <laughs> now what? Yeah. And it's, it's critical to understand. Uh, there's a, if, if you go to my Instagram, which is at real Joel Green, there's, there's a spin down the page a little bit. There's a, there's a thing I'll, I'll probably just do, post it again for, I have a lot of new followers. I call it the map of how everything works. And it's yeah. essentially, it's, it's an inverted sine wave where you look at year one, year two, year three, and year one, it's like, I found the answer. And then year two, year three, it's like, what's happening? And it really just speaks to the way everything works that um, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or, you know, uh, it, or, or you know, corn on the cob, it doesn't matter. Too much, when you, when you do a thing, the, 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 it doesn't matter what it is, the immediate effects in the body um, are very different from the long term, and that's because our body attenuates and adapts to everything we throw at it. Yeah. And so, if, if you want to, if you want to lie on a narrative or a story, then I think a pretty good one is that historically, because we didn't have refrigerators, 
we had seasons and those seasons dictated the availability of things. And so, you know, over time, there was a ton of variety in the diet, easily evidenced by anybody that wants to go and just research it. Like go come down here where I live, go to Mission San Juan, look at the wall, they got everything. The Indians ate, you know, they ate acorns, they ate um, crows, they ate berries, they ate um, roots, they ate uh, wool or uh, coyotes, they ate seals. I mean, they had really very, they ate whatever they could get. And factually speaking, and this is a fact, it can't be disputed, human beings are not, I repeat, not carnivores. They're omnivores. Yeah. And we're omnivores. But and there's, there's a big difference. Like when you look at like a pure carnivore and you look at the gut, again, let's just reverse engineer the gut bacteria. When you look at the gut bacteria of a pure carnivore, so, so I did this uh, recently, take a dog, for example, dogs are pure carnivores. Like when you give dogs omnivore diets, they get cancer, okay? And fat you're, you're, and diabetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So an omnivore's diet is very different. When you look at all the great apes, for the most part, you know, they're all omnivores. You know, like chimps, they'll eat a lot of plant matter, but they eat meat as well. You know, they do both. Um, when you look at the differences in an omnivore versus a carnivore diet, very, very different. Um, you feed a pure carnivore and omnivore's diet, they get cancer. You go and reverse engineer the bacteria that makes that, that carnivore healthy. You know what you get? You get fusobacteria. You know what you get? If you get too much of that in a human, you get cancer. Cancer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So very big difference between omnivores and carnivores. And, um, we're not carnivores. We're omnivores. Get it, get on. And we are omnivores. The same goes with the vegan diet. I think it's just as just un unnatural and inappropriate for the long haul. It can be a great intervention, but I just, you know, this whole, I've, I've always used the term diet agnostic for myself and I'm, yeah. you know, I'm even more firmly rooted in my agnost agnosticism over diet than, than ever before, because it just, um, I think it's just so limiting and it backs people's in. We see it all the time. It backs people into corners, um, both who are in leadership roles and people who are following them. So, oh, yeah, we, uh, we have, um, yeah, I, I would just mirror that for vegan. Like, so vegan diets can be wonderful protocols. I've seen people with life-threatening cholesterol issues completely resolve them on vegan diets. Yeah. Uh, you probably want to add some steak and some, you know, some, some liver and some other things in that diet eventually. Like, like again, over time, the same is true. So yeah. I agree. I love it. All right, sir. I think we're going to wrap up um, and we're going to promise people a follow up to get into all the other amazing things. How do people find you? And you've got a couple of amazing programs available for people. You've got a great book. So why don't you hook us up? <laughs> yeah. So, if, well, uh, Immunity Code, uh, find it on Amazon. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't read it, uh, get it. And then you can find me on Instagram at Real Joel Green. And then uh, a lot of stuff's coming out now. So um, the flagship is the Immune Centric Fat Loss Course. And these are all one thing. I, I started off a number of years ago to create a solution for what we see happening in real life. And so I'm just filling the blanks in now. Uh, so uh, some new products are out. You can find those all in my Instagram bio. Just look in the link there. And um, yeah, Real Joel Green at Instagram. And then all kinds of links there. Check them out. Great. And then your website is the... Veepnutrition.com. I'm sorry? Veepnutrition.com. Veepnutrition.com. So V like Victor, E E P, P like Peter, nutrition.com. So all these links will be in the show notes, guys. Joel, as always, a pleasure and a mind expanding experience. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you. for being here today. Thanks, Nat. Always fun. Thank you.